we are camera ready, join me in a warm welcome for Ken and Diane. that uh, my husband, Ken Kempe, is sitting there with me, and I have been asked is, why Morocco? How, how did we decide that we wanted to go on a birding trip there? And the reason, really, is because of a friend of ours who contacted us. So it was nearing the end of the pandemic. We're thinking, oh, maybe it's time to travel again, but hadn't figured out where to go. Gary Rosenberg, Ken's brother, um, is, a, is a friend of ours, and he wrote uh, saying, I'm going to go as a participant on a trip to Morocco with, with Ken and uh, led by John Sterling. And John Sterling had been leading tours to Morocco for almost a decade. Um, he sent the itinerary, 14-day Grand Morocco tour. Uh, that sounded really appealing to us. And about 15 minutes later, we, we replied and said, yes. <laughs> um, we'd like to do it. We contacted John Sterling, signed up for it, and um, we were ready to go. Here we are. So um, this is Gary, who, who contacted us, and John Sterling is here, and here's Ken Rosenberg. Uh, that did it. Um, so it was our guide, local guide in Morocco, Brahim Mazani, who took that group photo of us out in Morocco, and here he is. Um, he has his own company, Guy Wynn Birding Tours. Okay, yeah, just move it down a little. Okay, closer to you. Yeah. All right, so uh, Brahim Mazane was our local guide. I can, I'll just look at the, this instead of turning my head, that'll help. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, he, he knew the birds of Morocco really well, he knew where to take us to find the birds, and John had worked with Brahim um, in previous years too, so that all was great. Um, he's, he is a Berber, um, so he speaks the Berber language. They have to learn Arabic in school, they learn French, they learn Spanish, and he speaks English. So <laughs> that was all great for getting around in different parts of the country. Um, anyway, Gayuin is the name of his, uh, his company, and it means, it's the Berber name for the pharaoh eagle owl. And the pharaoh eagle owl was one of the birds that we really wanted to see, and we did see. Um, but it's sort of his, his trademark bird. Um, Morocco. So it's a country about the size of Texas. And it's bordered, um, I don't know if I can, can you see? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. It's got the Atlantic coast as well as the Mediterranean Sea as a border, and then to the west uh, is Algeria and the Sahara Desert. Um, there are, the Atlas Mountains are actually three different ranges that were formed at different times. Uh, the Anti-Atlas starting earliest uh, 300 million years ago when Africa and um, North America were actually abutting one another, and so a remnants of this time are still found in the Appalachians and they're the same as parts of the Anti-Atlas Mountains. Um, other parts, the High Atlas, were actually formed later with uh, tectonic plates between Africa and Eurasia meeting and pushing up the mountains, which are over 13,000 feet high in places. And then the Middle Atlas to the north is uh, lower and much more temperate. But these mountains divide Morocco into two sections where the, the western part uh, along the coast is very temperate, very green, and then the high mountains separate that from the very harsh and dry uh, western side where the Sahara Desert starts. But these different mountains, and the, there are plateaus and all kinds of things, they create a lot of different habitats for plants and animals. Um, Morocco is one of the most biodiverse countries in the Mediterranean region. For example, they have 7,000 different plants and 25% of them are endemic to Morocco. Oh, nice. um, so that means a lot more animal life too. Uh, this is the eBird map of where we went on the trip and Ken Rosenberg 
did all of the eBird lists <laughs> for this trip, and it made a great record of every place that we went, all the birds that we saw, and then participants in the trip could also upload their photographs to our eBird list, so it's a, it's a great record. So thanks, Ken, for doing all of that. <laughs> the red pins are eBird hotspots, and the blue pins are places that we went um, and just stopped on our way from here to there, uh, birding, and saw some great birds at those spots as well. Uh, we started the trip in Marrakesh, uh, just riding uh, in the car on the way from the airport to our Riyadh that we're staying. We realized that motorbikes are the preferred method of travel in that city, and you can carry whatever you need to on your motorbike. Um, uh, the Riyadh that we stayed in was in the, at the edge of the old part of the city. It didn't look like much from the outside, but you go in, it's, it's very uh, pleasant with you know, potted plants and a really lovely atmosphere that's very quiet. It feels very removed from the bustle of the city. And if you go upstairs, there's a rooftop restaurant. You can look out over the city and bird. Um, so that was really great that we were served Moroccan mint tea and Moroccan cookies and, uh, <laughs> and watch birds. Uh, one of the things we could look out at is the Qutubiyah Mosque. This was built in um, 1190, I believe, and it's a huge mosque that's still very much in use, and there were swifts flying around the mosque and also swifts flying around our Riyadh. And uh, Ken is going to be doing most of the talking about birds, and he'll talk more about the swifts that we saw uh, in a few minutes. But a uh, bird that I want to talk about is white stork because even though white storks are found in many places besides Morocco, it was a life bird for myself and Ken uh, because we'd never gone birding in Europe or, or other parts of the Mediterranean area. Um, so looking out and seeing the storks nesting on the chimneys of the city was really fun. And um, there were other towns that we went through with nesting storks as well. So John um, suggested that we all have a day in Marrakesh to explore the city before the birding part of the tour started and hired uh, a local guide who is an expert on the history of the area. And uh, just a few blocks from our Riyadh was the Bahia Palace. And it was really impressive. If you go to Marrakesh, you used to see it. It has all this fancy stucco work and marquetry and tiles. Um, it was um, built by a very powerful and rich Grand Vizier who wanted to have the most magnificent palace of its time. It took him and his son many, many years. <laughs> it's got 150 rooms, but what's impressive is all of these different um, details in the architecture. The ceilings are just incredible. Every surface is really detailed, so that was interesting to see. Um, we also walked through the narrow streets of the city, and that included uh, seeing some street musicians, and there was one here that we stopped to listen to, who was, he's a man playing a sinter, which is a, an instrument that's used primarily by the, um, let me see, I've got to remember the name here. Um, hmm. So I didn't write that down. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this, this man is from Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's an instrument that the people from this area that have come up to Morocco use, and we're going to hear a little bit of it if this works. <laughs> oh, can you hear? Uh, let's see. How, how does the volume go up? Well, it's not coming out of the yeah, speaker. It's not connected. It connected. Oh, it probably, we didn't, didn't have the sound sharing. No, oh, there's an idea. <laughs> Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> and, uh, but just watching him keeping time with the tassel on his hat and everything was very cool. And it's our local guide who's 
who's assisting him with the finger symbols. Um, uh, so in, in Marrakesh, we also went to the soup, which is fa world famous. Uh, uh, the outside here looks pretty calm. You get inside, and it is jammed with people. We were very glad to have a guide, because the it's a, a maze of alleyways. Um, and you can also see in here, Morocco is a, a fairly liberal Muslim country, and you can see the women wearing all different kinds of clothing. Uh, that was through, especially in the urban areas, of course, but um, there was a lot of uh, variation in, in the dress of people, both men and women. Um, this is the olive section of the souk. <laughs> so stall after stall with uh, lots of different kinds of olives. The olives that we had with just about every meal in Morocco were fantastic. I love olives and it was, the variety was really great. Um, but the, dis the way they display everything in the souks, because there is a lot of competition between different vendors, is so colorful and uh, really draws you in. So here with uh, you know, dried flowers and herbs and, uh, and little mortars and pestles for sale is pretty neat. Color was one of the things I really loved about this country. Here you can see some of the, the rugs. Uh, that these were made by a women's cooperative up in the mountains. Another place had women's scarves for sale out uh, next to a, a river where people were going with their families for picnics. Or even just walk, uh, looking out the window as we drive through some of the towns, the fashion or, or the clothing that people have creatively uh, put together and the um, fruit and other displays are all really colorful. The food was good. Um, we ate a lot of tagines, um, which are from the, the sky. Uh, we would stop at plate outdoor uh, cafes, and there would be these fire um, grates with, they could put the tagine on, it gets very sizzling hot at the bottom. The conical lid keeps the moisture in, um, and then when they bring it to your table with a flourish, They'll <laughs> lift off the lid, and your your food is really hot. Uh, uh, also, every Riyadh or hotel we went to served us Moroccan mint tea. This uh, proprietor in the center here is welcoming us into his Riyadh at uh, Agadir with Moroccan mint tea and cookies. And it's it's just a, a lovely custom. And up on the uh, top left is Berber pizza, which Brahim. Uh, gave us one one lunch. Uh, it's a stuffed bread. Some of the cities have these incredible gates as you enter them. This is the city of Rasani. It's a gateway to the Sahara Desert. This was the most elaborate of the gates, but also notice how clean the streets are. This was true everywhere we went. Uh, it was just really surprising. Rasani um, was also the place that we saw our first hoopo of the trip. This was another bird that um, my husband Ken and I really wanted to see on this trip. Uh, again, not found only in Morocco, found other places as well. But such a neat bird with this really crazy crest and the zebra striped wings, and it also makes a cool call. Let's see if I can. Oops. Oh, maybe you guys can't hear that either. I don't know if you can do it once you start it. Well, anyway, it's got a nice call. Yeah, here, again, can it? <laughs> it kind of says, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> um, looking out the bus windows again, or, or even stopping places um, at the architecture was interesting. The stone houses up in the high Atlas Mountains, um, or super modern buildings in the cities, or uh, many of the buildings are made of uh, the red earth that Morocco is famous for. This particular city, um, which was uh, in here, um, we noticed that all of the, the doors, the garage doors, the door, front doors were all green and asked Brahim about it and he said that the local government there had mandated that the doors be green so that the red and green would reflect like the Moroccan flag 
which has a reddish background and then a green star. So it was sort of interesting. <laughs> but by far the most spectacular uh, building that we saw was this Kasbah in Wazazart, uh, which is another gateway to the Sahara, but from the southwest. Um, so this building uh, was from the 17th century and was uh, then updated to some extent in the 1990s and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But it's also the setting for a lot of different movie scenes, including Game of Thrones, or um, Lawrence of Arabia, Gladiator. There's a whole bunch of them where scenes are shot um, in this casbah. And the parts that haven't been renovated, there are still families living in the old parts. It's a huge place. Okay, um, we'll get to the birds in a second, but these are just some more things. This was one trip that we were on. Most birding trips, we don't really stop to look at other things besides birds, but this one we stopped at a, a saffron place that had, uh, you could buy bulk saffron or saffron products. Uh, the Rose a Distillery, where you can see here that <laughs> the woman giving us the tour is having Ken Rosenberg try out the uh, rose water breath freshener. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Raheem's father runs this fossil shop that had so many ammonites, some of them are huge, that's a regular sized shoulder bag purse that's perched up there. Um, so this was, this was tall, this display. But they had small fossils and so on too, and Raheem, when he was young and was herding the family's animals in the mountains, would look for fossils for his father, and that was one of the the ways he contributed to the family. And this uh, last picture on the upper right of goats in the trees, that's uh, something I'd heard about ahead of time, that the goats love argon fruit. And these are argon trees. And the shepherds will sometimes choose trees close to the road so that tourists will stop and pay them a little bit of money to take <laughs> shots of their goats in the trees. And that's what happened here. Um, but below that is showing you the argan fruit, and the kernel inside the fruit is what argan oil is made of. And it's a Moroccan uh, specialty tree, and the oil is used for cosmetics, it's used for cooking, and you can even buy argan butter there, which is a lot like peanut butter. All right, back to our itinerary and the birds. So uh, we started, oh, I think I can use my, yeah. So as I said, we started in Marrakesh. It's not far to the Atlas Mountains. That's, that's right here. So the Atlas Mountains are sort of this gray part right here. Um, somehow, oh, I see. Okay. Um, then we headed north and went north of Rabat along the coast to a, a wetland area. And there was also a lake there with waterfowl that we saw. We came back through the Middle Atlas Mountains, through the forests there, across some high plains, onto the, um, oops, I'm forgetting to advance here. Um, so there's the forest. Then we went through plains to the Sahara Desert. These are the Erg Chebi Dunes, really spectacular, very soft sand. Um, and again, through more plains areas and onto the coast near Agadir. This, this was the, the last part of the tour. So in all uh, of our 14 days there, we saw more than 200 species of birds, and that included North African endemics, desert birds, really specialists, uh, 13 species of larks, um, European uh, birds that are resident both in Morocco and in Europe, and also migrants that were coming through. This was in May that we were in Morocco, and coastal and wetland birds. And Ken is going to come up and tell you about those birds. All right, well, thanks, um, Diane. And uh, it's great to be here with everyone. Yeah, this was a really fun trip. Uh, it was my first time, actually, uh, in this part of the world. And so as a co-leader, I had to learn the birds as we were 
going, and a lot of them were new for me. But um, so, so as Diane said, that you know, this is not like a tropical country with hundreds and hundreds of species, but for for this region, it's very diverse because of the mountains and the desert and the and the coastal areas. So there's a great variety of birds. Um, so we started in Marrakesh and right at the hotel, as Diane said, with some uh, urban birds. And of course, if you're in any urban area in the whole world, you're seeing our familiar house sparrow. So that was one of the first birds we saw, but it's right there with uh, the locally endemic house bunting. Um, and there are starlings there, but it's a different species of starling. They actually don't have any spots, and they're called the spotless starling. <laughs> and there are pigeons, and there are our variety of pigeons, but also um, wild pigeons, common wood pigeon, which is a European species that, that gets into North Africa. So, that was, so we started out there on the rooftop of the hotel um, watching these swifts, and there were hundreds and hundreds of swifts that, that came in, and as the afternoon got later and later, more and more of them were, were circling around. And boy, thank goodness for digital photography, because if this was a, a film photography trip, <laughs> I mean, we took hundreds and hundreds of pictures of these swifts trying to get, and got like one or two that, uh, that came out. And most of them, it turned out, were pallid swifts, which is an interesting species found in North Africa. It has that really pretty scaly pattern there. There were also some little swifts, and I should say that um, a majority of the pictures in this show are mine, and then others from, from Diane and Ken and others who were on the trip. And if none of us got a good picture, I took uh, some shots off of uh, eBird and put the name of the photographer on there, so you know, you'll see who, who took the pictures if it, if it wasn't mine. There were... Um, Quite a few raptors to be seen right there over the city. Black kites are a very common uh, bird that uh, circle, circles around. Um, and we even saw a couple of booted eagles flying right over the hotel. So as we got, got out into the countryside, there were some common birds that we were seeing right along the road, sort of in the wetter agricultural areas. Uh, there are magpies there, and this is a bird that's just been split as a separate species, as the Maghreb magpie, and Maghreb is a word that uh, means Morocco, actually, so that we, we heard that name a lot, and quite a few of the birds had the name Maghreb in their name. Um, <clears throat> Witchat shrike was another common bird along the roads. Uh, white wagtails, and again, a Moroccan subspecies. Of, of white wagtail that we saw. And then we stopped at this uh, little school along the road where there was a colony of lesser kestrels. It's the only lesser kestrels we saw on the, on the whole trip was at this school. And that's a, uh, a digiscope photo of the lesser kestrel that Ken got. So our first real destination was in the high Atlas Mountains. And we went right up to the top, the highest elevation. And it's actually a ski area and it was supposed to be covered with snow, but uh, this year, this was this past May, was a, it's the middle of a big drought in North Africa and in Morocco, so there was no snow anywhere. And so one of our first target birds that we're really looking forward to see is this crimson-winged finch. And sort of like the rosy finches out west here in North America, they hang around the snow field and there wasn't any snow. So we actually missed our first target bird, <laughs> which we didn't see any crimson winged finches, but we did see rock sparrows were one of the common birds there. And then these alpine chuffs, which are, um, well, red-billed chuff, I guess they're called, which are crow-like birds. And there, there was a flock of about 200 of them that was circling over the parking lot there when we, when we arrived. Um, we did a lot of birding, sort of looking around the rocky area, and uh, it's interesting how, uh, and this is true throughout Morocco, the colors of these birds, you could just really see the way they, the way they blend in with the background, especially that sort of unique salmon reddish pink. But we saw our first lark up there, and it's, uh, it's really a horn lark, but it's a, a separate subspecies that's probably going to be split as the atlas horned lark. Uh, there were moussiers and black red starts there on the rocks and uh, also rock buntings. 
right up near uh, in the high elevation above the tree line, there was a little stream that came down and we birded along that stream and we found uh, a dipper, which was really cool. That's the white-throated dipper that's found over there. Also, uh, gray wagtails walking on the rocks in the stream and there were blue rock thrushes uh, on the rocks above the stream and a missile thrush, which is a European species, one of those that just gets down into Morocco and North Africa at higher elevations. And then down below the tree line was a forest of atlas cedars. And it's a coniferous tree, uh, and it had um, a bunch of unique birds, also mostly European birds that were sort of found at this high elevation in, in Morocco. Um, the coal tit, which is a chickadee-like bird, uh, common firecrest, which is very much like our golden crown kinglet. There were flocks of hawfinches moving through the treetops and a common red star. And then when we crossed the middle Atlas Mountains, we're at a sort of a more temperate um, elevation and there were these beautiful, it was a beautiful oak forest that we were in. And that's where um, a number of the truly endemic birds that are, that are found only in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco are found. And so our main target was the Atlas flycatcher, which is a, a migratory bird that goes down into southern Africa for the winter, but they had just arrived back on territory. And, and sort of the whole tour is really timed to be able to get Atlas flycatcher as well as some of the other migrants coming through. So a couple of the other birds we saw there in the, in the oaks were the African blue tit, uh, this really cool green woodpecker called the valence woodpecker. And then this is also where we saw a troop of Barbary apes. It's a kind of macaque that's endemic to uh, North Africa. And there were also some more of these uh, European species that are found at higher elevations in northern Morocco. A European roller, a really cool turquoise colored bird, um, great spotted woodpecker, there's a subspecies uh, that's only found in Morocco and that's also true of uh, Eurasian jays. And then as we're coming down out of the mountains we stopped at another really nice little hotel and did some more rooftop birding there and saw um, several more um, of these European birds, a common nightingale, a chaffinch, a lot of Euro European greenfinches, and European robins. And yeah, unfortunately, the, the sounds really don't work, but that was a, that was a nightingale. <laughs> Beautiful song. And Diane got that shot of it singing. Um, we didn't do a lot of night birding, but we, we did some there in the, in the Middle Atlas Mountains. And uh, one of the guys on our trip, uh, Richard Baxter, is an Australian, and he's actually a tour guide in Australia, but he was doing a big year through Africa. Um, and he joined, he joined our tour in Morocco. And so he was really gung-ho uh, for owling especially. He had this giant megaphone that uh, you could project like a mile away, the calls of these birds. But we did see the Maghreb owl, which is um, endemic to the Atlas Mountains, as well as Eurasian scops owls, which is a screech owl type bird that's, that's more widespread. I've got the call, but we probably won't hear it. You hear it a little, sort of like a barred owl. drop down, you know, this was really the highlight, drop down into the Sahara Desert. And we're right on the Algerian border, but some of these uh, real Sahara Desert dunes just get into uh, that southeastern corner of Morocco. And that's the Erg Chebi Dunes, that's pictured there in the top. And then I've got a, a Google Earth image of those dunes from, from space, just to, to give you an idea of uh, of where we went birding, what we would do is we moved around, you could really see that it's not very uniform. 
And to look for these target birds in the Sahara Desert, we would go to these different microhabitats that were around the sand dune area. And so those images are actually, if you're doing eBird, you know that eBird keeps your GPS track. So those are our tra eBird tracks, and you can sort of see that each one of them, just from the colors, are in a very different kind of desert, different, different microhabitats, sometimes just a, um, a little bit of scrubby, scrubby shrubs or, um, or an oasis that we would visit there <coughs> around the dunes. And the one in the lower left is actually our hotel that we stayed at. Uh, the Dunes Door Hotel, and you can just see that it looks like there are a lot of trees when you're there, but it's really just a dot, a dot in the desert. And we <laughs> rode around in uh, a caravan of these SUVs, and that's how we did our birding, and with local, the local guides knew where every place was, and they just drove us there, basically. And as you're driving through the gravel plains, uh, cream-colored courser was one of the common birds, and that's an adult on the left and a, a juvenile in the upper right. Um, we saw Moroccan spiny-tailed lizards, which were sort of iguana size, a couple of feet long, and there's, uh, not surprisingly, there's a pretty high diversity of um, lizards and uh, reptiles in Morocco as well, and we saw several really cool lizards. Uh, Brown-necked raven was another bird we saw just as we were driving around. Uh, one of the first main destinations was um, this water hole, and just some guy has a tiny little speck of, of water on his property out there, and um, groups like ours will pay in order to go and visit. And because water is so scarce, it's attracting all these birds. And the main attraction here are sand grouse, which are these really interesting birds, and these birds will come from I don't know, 50, 100 miles away probably to get their drink of water every morning. And so flocks and flocks of these sand grouse would come in and they are swirling around, flying, and then they, they come in and land and then walk or run uh, on the ground over to the water. And let's see, the little video that Diane got. <laughs> the sounds that they're making, but um, besides drinking, what the sand grouse are doing is they're dipping their bellies in the water, and they're soaking their belly feathers and gathering water, and that water will actually stay in their belly feathers, and they can fly for miles and miles back to their nest and actually feed the water back to the young. So that's the way these sand grouse survive, and every day the flocks come in the morning to, to these water holes. And there were three species of sand grouse at this water hole. They're mostly spotted and crowned sand grouse. Um, but then a few of these really, the real spectacular one was the pintailed sand grouse with the male up on the top and, and the female, the great uh, shot that Diane got in, in the lower right there. Um, my car wasn't quite positioned right. I, I barely got a look at the pintailed sand grouse, but everybody else got uh, good pictures of them. And then we would go to all these little spots, and this is a little oasis where we saw uh, the only desert sparrows, one of the target birds of the trip, and also, that's my brother Gary. It this was very strenuous birding that we were doing on this trip. And, uh, but there were a couple of these desert sparrows, and they, their nests were actually in those ceramic were those like light, light posts? I think they were. Yeah, yeah like light, guided light posts on the walkways. That's where these desert sparrows were, were nesting. But there's just a couple of trees out in the middle of nowhere in, in a, a little house. And this was another fun spot that they took us to this place. Can you uh, see the birds in this photo or see how many <laughs> there are? So right in the shadow of that bush is the... An Egyptian nightjar with two babies, or chicks, and they're just sitting, sitting in the sand, spending the whole day uh, in the shade of this tiny little shrub. And the, the guys knew where it was. They just took us right to it, set up the scopes, and watched it. But then we ranged out, like even so. There we are walking out there in these. 
just looks really barren, but it's a, just a, a enough of those little shrubs to have a couple of these uh, endemic birds. And the two targets here were uh, two kinds of warblers, actually, the African desert warbler and the scrub warbler. And the desert warbler was just hiding in these tiny little shrubs, and the scrub warbler would run around on the ground uh, around the shrubs. And we saw a bunch of other interesting desert birds, uh, these birds that are sort of cardinal size and travel around in little noisy groups were the fulvous chatterers. <laughs> and then there were shrikes, and this is the great gray shrike, which is a common European species, but again, it's a Sahara subspecies of the great gray shrike. And we went to a couple of places that had these uh, gorges, like, like here in Ithaca, with big red rock cliffs. Uh, it's really spectacular scenery. And believe it or not, one of the target birds there was the rock pigeon. <laughs> and these are real rock pigeons. This is where all the pigeons have, uh, come from, They're from around the world. The wild populations are on these cliffs in North Africa. So it was very exciting to enter rock pigeon on your Eber checklist and not have to say feral. <laughs> Other birds that were in the rocky areas, the trumpeter finch, uh, there were crag martins flying around, and a little owl um, hiding in some of the caves and the, the rock crevices. We went out to this other area that was just a whole series of, of cliffs called the Eastern Escarpment. And there were uh, Barbary falcons, which is a, a race of peregrine falcon out there, but then there was also lanner falcon, and we found a nest, an eyrie of a lanner falcon that had four half-grown chicks that uh, you could see in the lower right there. And uh, long-legged buzzard was another raptor that was uh, on the cliffs. But the object of our quest there, oh, <laughs> okay, no, that's, not, that's right. Yeah, was, um, I, thought I, I thought I was going to animate the name last, but I didn't. Uh, the Pharaoh Eagle Owl, as Diane said, that's the mascot bird of the, of the tour group, that the tour company of Brahim. And so to get the Pharaoh Eagle Owl, we hiked way out into this escarpment, and there were local guides that were actually scouting ahead of us, trying to figure out where the owls uh, might be. And we walked and walked and, and got up underneath the, the escarpment uh, and finally did spot uh, the pharaoh eagle owl up in its cave, you know, halfway up the, the mountain. So that was really cool. But after I got home and I was looking at my pictures, which were not as good as that one, um, of the owl up on the cliff, I noticed that in that dark area of the cave was a little baby. Uh, which we had not seen while we were there, so, so that, that was fun. All right, the larks. So this, this trip was really uh, a, a lark. Uh, and we had already seen the Atlas horn lark, but now we're going after these others. And they all sort of look the same. They're, they're kind of dull brownish birds, but they're all very distinctive. Um, in their song and very distinctive in the, again, the microhabitat. So the first set of larks were out in these high grassy plains, uh, but again, because it was a drought, there was no grass, so it was actually hard to find a couple of them. Um, greater short-toed lark was one of the most common ones, and I do have the song, which we're probably not going to hear. <laughs> So they're up in the sky, kind of like our horn larks are. Um, there was also crested lark, uh, the Maghreb subspecies, and then the, the hard to find one was the calandra lark, uh, but we did see one. And then, really an aesthetic uh, moment for the trip was to find a bunch of these larks, we actually had to go out what would a birding trip be without uh, a good garbage dump? <laughs> so uh, near this town, this is sort of in the high desert, um, it's just a landfill where the garbage is just spread for acres and acres over the, over the desert. But that's, for some reason, that's where they took us, and that's where all the birds were. 
Yeah. Uh, maybe it's the structure that it provides, but we saw several species of larks there at the dump, and uh, thick-billed lark, Tenix lark, uh, Thecla's lark, and then really cool one was the greater hoopo lark, and you can see that black and white wing pattern like, like a hoopo. And these were all just running around. Uh, it was hard to get a picture of them, actually, without trash. And then, um, sort of in the, the, this place called the Tuglet Tract, so it's a higher desert area in the foothills, we went after several other species of larks, and there the, the really hard to find when we're walking out through that little tiny, uh, those shrubs, looking for DuPont's lark. And the DuPont's lark, if you've ever looked for thrashers out in the southwestern U.S., the DuPont's lark is like a like a Leconte thrasher. It's just running on the ground and hiding behind the shrubs. So that one was quite a, quite a lot of work to, to find that one. Um, and we saw bar-tailed lark in the more rocky areas, and then the one that's actually called desert lark, which is kind of crazy because they're all desert larks. <laughs> the desert lark we, we eventually saw there as well. And again, you can see how each species sort of blends in so beautifully with the soil type and rock type where, where it's found. And it wasn't just larks, there were weed ears. Mm -hmm. And there were eight species of weed ears we saw on this trip in, in Morocco. And uh, the northern weed ear is the one you might know, it's the one you can see up in, in Alaska and sometimes comes through here as, as a vagrant. And we did see a couple of northern weed ears and they're trans-Sahara migrants. So those birds were coming back north and then all the others were uh, residents uh, in the area. The Atlas weed ears up in the high mountains uh, along with black weed ears, uh, red rumped and morning weed ears in some of the rockier areas, desert weed ear out in the flat plains and the black eared, western black eared weed ear was over near the coast. So just like the larks, each weed ear was sort of in its own uh, microhabitat. Um, a fun thing about desert birding, which is true here if you go to Arizona or California, it's great to find an oasis um, of trees in the desert because that's like a magnet for birds and especially um, for migrants. And so we stayed at this little hotel that, that was an oasis and it was just um, planted with all these trees. And so we were seeing quite a few migrants in there, including spotted flycatcher, pied flycatcher, golden orioles, which are, again, coming back from south of the Sahara and southern Africa, heading north. And there was a family of Eurasian sparrowhawks in that grove that was making a pretty good living uh, eating the migrants as, as they came through. And a lot of the migrants were warblers. Now, in Europe, it's a sort of a poor excuse for, for a warbler, but this is what the European warblers look like and what they have to deal with. And we, I don't know, we saw about eight or 10 species and they all, they all look like this. Uh, so, you know, it's a pretty esoteric thing doing, doing the European warblers, but we spent quite a lot of time uh, tracking them down and identifying them. Melodious warbler was one of the more common ones and at least had a little bit of yellow on it. Um, Western Benelli's warbler, uh, wood warblers and willow warblers are actually going all the way up north to, on their way to Scandinavia and northern, northern Europe and we're stopping in these oases. So, so that kind of added to the diversity of the birds and, and the trip. And sometimes even just an isolated tree or shrub like that would have one or two warblers uh, in it. So that was fun. There were some warblers that actually had a little bit of color and pattern to them, and these were some of the breeding warblers in Morocco. Uh, the Sardinian warbler was pretty common in a number of shrubby areas, uh, but Tristram's warbler was the rarest, and that's the one that we stopped at a very specific spot in this sort of pinion juniper looking habitat with reddish clay earth, and, and the bird uh, kind of matched that. Uh, the Western Orphean Warbler we saw in the Argonne uh, tree orchard, so the Argonne forest. And then Western Subalpine Warbler was, was over in the coast in this really um, short coastal scrub. As we got uh, towards the coast, uh, there were some, some river valleys and, and some of the vegetation started to get a little uh, wetter again. And 
um, very birdy, and, and, and some of the common open country birds that we, we saw in these areas included European turtle doves, common stone chat, uh, the black crown chagra, which is a kind of shrike. You can see that hooked bill there. And then rufous-tailed uh, scrub robins, just a few, uh, few of the birds there. And our first real target when we got back over to the coast was this uh, northern bald ibis, which was on the coastal sand dunes around Ag Agadir. And the, the northern bald ibis is a critically endangered species. There are only about 700 of them left right now. And, um, and this area was a national park where they were. And they're actually pretty easy to see once you went to that exact spot. We saw their tracks in the sand quite a bit. Um, we mostly just saw them fly over. I didn't really get views like those other pictures that I was able to find, but they're uh, kind of a grotesque uh, looking bird. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, uh, even the waterfowl there were cool. I don't really like ducks much, but it was, it was fun seeing in some of these new new ducks uh, in, in these wetlands that were just in from the coast. Um, ruddy shell duck, marbled teal. The, the white-headed ducks were nesting there, so they were, they're, that's like a ruddy duck. Uh, there were all these little baby white-headed ducks uh, with them, and uh, ferruginous duck is a pretty spectacular looking bird. And the marshes there at the edge of these wetlands, we saw things like black-winged stilt, and red knobbed coots and great crested grebes. And um, the rare one that we were looking for there, and we did see, but not as well as that photo, was uh, African swamp hen, right the northern edge of its range. And we had kind of a funny experience, because we, we were looking for rails, and uh, like all rails, they're staying very hidden, hidden in the marsh. We're trying to get a look at this, this water rail that was just peeking out, and then I think all of us were looking in the other direction, and my brother Gary looked, and, and the water rail just ran across the way, right in front of him, snapped a couple of quick shots, and then I think any of the rest of us saw him. Another thing we did over near the coast is we, we went on a, the, again, so Brahim knew all these guys in each place, and so we got to the, the marsh owl spot, and he had his local guys go out, and they would, they would walk out through this wet, grassy area because they knew where the marsh owl was roosting, and we were successful. Sure enough, the, this marsh owl flushed and flew around. It's kind of like a short-eared owl, and flew right up in front of us. And we also saw a Eurasian hobby there, which is a medium-sized falcon. There were um, Eurasian thick knees, which is uh, a really cool relative of the shorebirds, but it's a nocturnal bird. So they just sit in the fields during the day, and then they go out and forage at night. You can see that giant yellow eye. So that gives you a hint that it's a nocturnal bird. And then these Pratt and Coles, were, that was one of my favorite birds in trip. I've always wanted to see Pratt and Coles. They're, they're a shorebird, but they're kind of like a cross between a plover and a swallow. So they sit on the ground like a plover, and then they go up in their aerial insectivores, and they fly around uh, in the sky hunting grass on, um, dragonflies and things. We went out in a boat into this uh, estuary of north of Marrakesh near Rabat, and so this is just another added feature of being in this region in May, is seeing the European shorebirds um, coming north. And so these are some of the species that we sometimes see around here as a vagrant, like curlew sandpiper. Uh, that one is, is just in a transitional plumage, molting into its breeding plumage. A uh, bar-tailed godwit, common sandpiper, which is very much like our spotted sandpiper, common ring plover. So there were lots and lots of these European shorebirds that were coming through, and that was, that was really fun. And also uh, some wading birds. The white storks that are nesting on the rooftops have to go down into the wetlands to feed. Um, so we saw little egrets and some groups of greater flamingos and Eurasian spoonbills among the, the different wading birds there. And of course, you, you have to look at 
look for gulls always, and so out on the beaches there, uh, there was some pretty good, good gulling. Uh, it was interesting that the most common gull was the lesser blackback gull, which is one that, again, we, we look for it here as a rarity, but that there were lots and lots of lesser blackbacks and all kinds of different plumages. And then the yellow-legged gull is the breeding bird that's in that region that's sort of like their herring gull. The slender bill gull is a very rare gull, and we were, we were lucky to see that one. That was one of our target species. Looks pretty distinctive with that very um, thin, thin, dark bill. Um, a little tern is, again, a lot of these things are the equivalents of, of what we know here, the, the least tern. And then we finished the trip, uh, our last day at uh, Agadir on the coast, we spent sea watching. So very different from, from desert birding and just training the scopes out, to, out in the ocean. And we did see quite a few northern gannets uh, flying by and uh, quarry shearwaters. Those were the two most common birds. But um, there was another rare gull, the Ottawin's gull, that we saw a few of there on the outer beach. And then the, the rarest one, which only a few people really got a, a good look at, was the, uh, I'm not even sure how to say it, Bal Balearic shearwater, a small uh, brown and white shearwater that was, that was flying north there. So with the, you know, we ended with the sea watching, with the desert and the forest and, and the shorebirds. There, there was a really fun trip, a lot of, a lot of diversity, uh, beautiful weather every day, and, and great company. So uh, and we're heading back to Morocco in May of 2024, if anybody's uh, interested enough. But, uh, so thanks for coming along with us, and I, I think we can answer any questions. We didn't see that many, but they said there were that many. That, yeah, they're, they're nesting in cavities in the buildings. So there were a bunch of different buildings there, and they were, um, we primarily saw a couple of pairs and a juvenile being fed. So it wasn't really the peak nesting season, I guess, but. Um, so if they're lesser, does that mean they're smaller? Or they're less fewer? <laughs> Not as important, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they were actually, they weren't as easy to tell apart. There were a few other times we thought we had lesser kestrels and they turned out to be Eurasian kestrels. So I guess it is a little smaller. Um, I'm not real familiar with them, but. Uh, yeah, spots are, they don't have as, as many spots as uh, Eurasian kestrels. Oh. Uh, yeah, not as many spots in the, in the plume. Yeah, They're very plain, plain reddish oh. color. And there is difference in the eye, eye, eye spot. Yeah, but the colonial nature was interesting. Yeah, I don't know much about that, Mari. Yeah, uh, Ken Haas. Uh, is the feral eagle owl closely related to the Eurasian eagle owl? Um, it is. Yeah, there are several several eagle owls. In fact, I think the pharaoh is one of the ones, and there's another one in the Middle East that have been split off. This is what's happening everywhere, is these widespread species are being split into regional species. So the pharaoh eagle owl is the eagle owl of North, Af North Africa there. Tom? So this isn't a question, but it, but it is a relevant comment. I think it was very helpful to have the uh, environmental pictures in the middle mm -hmm. to give us an idea of where you saw them. And many of the, the scenes were like just very barren, and you wouldn't even think there would be any birds there in the first place, but yeah. surprisingly diverse. Yeah, well, that's why I showed that shot of, of the desert dunes, and you know, to show you, it might have been hard to see, but each one of those places was a very distinct looking microhabitat, and they just drove us. We didn't know where we were, but they were driving <laughs> us all over the place, 
in this caravan, and then we would stop and go, okay, well, over there is a desert warbler. And sure enough, if you look closely, you know, different looking shrubs, and, and you know, and that's the only, and that's the only spot they have for it. Yeah. So. Sunny pictures like this, so was it really hot there? Or? No. Uh, it was hot in the Sahara. Not super, super hot though, but uh, we did want to turn on air conditioning when we got to, to the room. But uh, most places, you can see like here, um, you know, we're, we look pretty comfortable. Um, and up in the mountains, we had expected snow, so we brought all kinds of winter gear with us, but it was probably in the 50s or 60s or something like that. It wasn't, wasn't bad. And uh, Marrakesh is, was very comfortable. Okay. I was thinking that like, the temperatures are like 100 degrees or... No, we never had any... No, I think it would be in the summer, but that's another reason, yeah. you know, going at this time of year, you're just catching the transition in the seasons, and so you have the migrants coming through, and. Um, I guess their previous tour, which had been a week earlier, uh, two years earlier that John took, they had a, a, a snowstorm up at that ski area, and they just got completely blizzarded out. And um, so we were kind of prepared for that, but it, it was downright pleasant uh, on our trip. Yeah, and the coast was, of course, really pleasant. Uh, yeah, or. Um, not specifically, although, you know, most of the places I've been, I would say, are a lot worse than that. So it, it did seem like, uh, I mean, there were some nice national parks, and it seemed like in almost every place we went, you know, um, tourism is pretty big in Morocco, so, and they were, again, you know, they were taking us to places where the local people were making money off their birds, and so, so that's good. I mean, I'm sure we paid people to go um, look for, at their desert sparrows in their front yard, you know, they probably thought we were crazy, but. <laughs> so I think that kind of transition is happening in a lot of places where, you know, people realize it's more economical to actually protect the birds and preserve them and invite people to come and see them and, and, and pay for them. So, um, you know, falconry is big in all those countries, so the, the eBird locations for the ladder falcon, the barbed falcon, are all hidden as sensitive. You know, if you were to go look there. So, um, but these birds were right out in the open. So you would think that if, if people knew about them and they were intent on, you know, hunting them or stealing them, they would be able to. So, I don't know. I got, I got a sense that it was a not the kind of country where there was a lot of um, persecution of the birds. Yeah, I felt like the, the national parks, you could tell they were putting money into that and trying to make the habitats appropriate for wildlife. Yes? Um, I'm curious about the local birders that were your guides. Did they refer to the birds using the scientific Latin name or the English common name? Well, they used the English name because they knew we, we needed that. Uh, that's another thing that, especially in Latin America traveling, I mean, they, they might communicate with each other uh, with using the sign, although there it's probably more of the, the Berber name, the local language names. In Latin America, everybody uses the scientific name, but then they have to learn the English name in order to make a living guiding, guiding right. us around. So, you know, that's... For better or for worse, that's kind of the universal language, and they they do right. use the English names. And you know, if you go on their Facebook page, for example, uh, Brahim's brother, what's his name? Hamid. Hamid, yeah, Hamid bird watching. I mean, every day he's posting these great pictures of Moroccan birds with little English stories. So, you know, that's that's their business, and they're they're very good at it. I was birding in Poland in the fall and we had a couple local guides and they referred exclusively to the birds with the scientific Latin names. Really? So yeah. that, was, that was 
interesting to me and helpful because um, you know it was clear when I saw something that looked like a chickadee um, and they had a different name for it and I looked at the scientific name it was you know clearly a different species so. yeah well that you know if they're especially if they're scientists that's the way they're they're right. communicating um, it, it, it used to be that knowing the scientific names, that was the stability, and then everywhere you went there were different names in the scientific, but lately the taxonomists have scrambled the birds so badly that all the, all the scientific names that I learned in South America, for example, are mostly useless, and I have to refer to the common name to remember, okay, that's what they now call this, but, yeah. Yes? Were there any birds that weren't there because of the drought? Well, just the uh, crimson wing finch, I think, was the only, uh, well, alpine centaur. So two of the birds that really needed the snow fields, they were probably there, but they just weren't down low enough where we could drive, drive over and see them. But I think we got everything else, including that lark that was needed the grassland, but we found a spot that, that had them. So they were in lower densities, probably, but they were there. Uh, that is one thing about the birding in Morocco as compared to some other places we've been. The density of birds for each species, ex except for the sand grouse and a few other things, was low. So we would go and we would see, you know, one to four individuals of that particular species. So it's, it's tricky and that's why the guides were so helpful. Hmm. Yeah. What made your target list? What did, how did you decide that before you went? Well, there's a set of birds that are endemic to Morocco, so we assume that anyone go birding in Morocco wants to see that set of birds. Um, and then the target list is determined partly by the people. Uh, it's always, you know, the group. So, you know, Ken and Diane wanted to see Hoopo. Uh, was it Gary who was bent on seeing a bee eater? You know, we kept turning the, the van around. Oh, that's because I hadn't seen one of the bees. Oh, yeah. he, he wanted me to find yeah. that bee eater. <laughs> so sometimes it's a moving target, uh, yeah. literally. But um, you know, but when you're putting together a, a, a trip like this, you, you start with the endemic birds. Like if that's your only chance in your life to go to that area, you want to make sure you see all the all the local endemics, and then everything else you kind of build from. One last question. Was there a critically endangered bird other than the bald-headed ibis like that, which is a rarity like that in Morocco? Oh, um, that's a yeah, not that I, not that I could think of. Yeah, even like the eagle owl is very widespread. Um, it's not clear why the why the ibis is. I think there's a lot of mythology around it. And I think they're hunted, uh, not really for food, but maybe just because they're so ugly, people have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the vult. Well, yeah. We, the vultures are endangered. There weren't really any species there in Morocco that we were looking for. Anyone? What vultures? Which? What vultures were there? No, no, I said like the bald and vultures. She's asking me. Which vultures? No, I'm not seeing any vultures. Did you find No, one? I mean, there was one. John said he saw a, a griffin fly over, but nobody I, I saw it oh, briefly, yeah. but oh, it was I like a split second. I was okay. the one pointing it out to him, but then I didn't put it on my list because oh, right. it was I so fast. You made that up. What yeah. is it? <laughs> yeah, Eurasian griffin, but. Um, Yeah, it, um, so we should probably wrap this up now because we all have to be out of the building. Oh, sorry, one more, Wes? Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, were there any uh, tribal mythologies associated with the birds? You know, can we talk maybe like, like yeah. like feathers or certain so. rituals or, or apparel, headdress, so forth? We didn't see any of that. Um, did you? Not that, I, not that I know of there. I mean, other than the falconry, which is the really long-standing tradition, but um, I'm sure Brahim would have stories, and he'd probably love to talk about it. So come to Morocco. And, and we can ask. <laughs> How about uh, cage birds in, the, in homes for a song? 
Did, didn't see that either. I mean, there is from the previous question, I mean, a lot of these European migrants are hunted around the Mediterranean uh, for food, you know, but, you know on, in uh, Cyprus and, and in Italy, and I don't think it's as bad in, in Morocco, but that's the main threat for these uh, trans-Sahara migrants coming north is they're just hunted relentlessly throughout the Mediterranean region. So it's not really cage birds, it's, it's more for the dinner table. Mm. I have one more question. Was it very windy? No, no. not that bad. Yeah, we, we, I think we were lucky, but it was beautiful weather most of the places. Yeah, the weather was really pretty good. Okay, thanks everybody.